Chapter 19. I am not your perfect Mexican daughter. I reek by the time I land in Mexico, aggressively so. Thanks to severe thunderstorms, I spent the whole night gripping my seat, worrying that I was going to plummet to my death. First I want to die, and then I don't. Life is weird like that. I look at my armpits and they are drenched. Not exactly a fresh start for me here. I search for my water bottle in my bag and discover it spilled all over my things. I probably didn't screw the cap on right. I don't know why, but I always do that. I can be so careless. As I sift through my stuff to see the damage, I remember Olga's receipt. I open my journal and there it is, wet and smeared, of course. I can only make out some of the numbers and letters, and what scares me the most is that I don't remember if I disabled her password. That is so typical of me, always making things harder for myself. Como me gusta la mala vida. Fuck, what am I going to do now? The old chucho picks me up from the airport in the rusted and battered pickup he's had since I was a kid. His hair is gray and wild, but his mustache is still black and neatly trimmed. Theo has silver clapped poor people teeth and looks much older than the last time I saw him. When he hugs me, I can smell the sweat and dirt in his clothes. Ama said Theo hasn't been the same since his wife died. I was so little, so I don't remember when it happened, but I can sense a brokenness about him that I think will never ever go away. I suppose that's why he's never remarried. He and his wife only had one child, my cousin Andres, who I'm guessing is about 20 now. Los Ojos is nearly four hours away, deep in the mountains, in the middle of nowhere. Once we get on the road, Theo Chucho asks me about school because he's heard I'm having a hard time. I wonder how much he knows. He seems to think Ama sent me here because I was getting bad grades. I'm not going to correct him. It's okay, I just want to go to college already. Good, that is what I want to hear, mija. Don't work like a donkey like the rest of your family. He shows me his callous hands and then looks at mine. Look at you. You have rich lady hands. Why is everyone in my family always talking about donkeys? I look down at my hands and realize he's right. They are smooth and soft, not at all like my parents, which are always chapped and worn. My hands look like they've never had to work hard, and I'd like to keep them that way. I want to be a writer, I tell Pio Chucho. A writer? For what? You know they don't make any money, right? You want to be poor your whole life? I roll my eyes. I'm not going to be poor. Just make sure you work in a nice office. Remember, don't work like a donkey, I say, before he can finish. Theo Chucho laughs. Of course, you already know. I nod. Everyone tells me to work in an office, which shows they don't know me at all. That's why I never talk about what I want to do with my life. I'm so sorry about Olga, Theo finally says. What a shame. She was such a good girl. We all loved her so much. Ay, mi pobre hermana, la inocente. I wince. He didn't really know Olga. No one did. The day is bright with a few fat clouds scattered throughout the sky. The Sierra Madre mountains are so stark and impossibly tall that they fill me with an inexplicable panic. After studying them for a few seconds, I have to look away. I miss her, but it's better now. I finally tell Theo Chucho. Time heals, etc. That's not true and he knows it better than anyone. But that's just what I say to make people feel better. Theo sighs. You know, we couldn't go to the funeral because we couldn't get visas. And then the money, of course. Que lastima. We are all very sad. We wanted to be there for the family. I understand, I say. I don't want to talk about my sister anymore, so I pretend to fall asleep until I do. I wake up with drool trickling down my chin. I must have slept almost four hours because we're already pulling up to Mama Jacinta's house. The land is dry and dusty and my mouth is sour with thirst. Mama Jacinta runs to the pickup with her arms outstretched and tears in her eyes. She hugs me and covers my face with kisses. She's just as warm and soft as I remember, but her cropped hair is now entirely gray. Mika, Mika, you are so beautiful, she says over and over. I start crying too. There's a crowd of people behind her, aunts, uncles, cousins, and people I either don't know or don't remember. My cousin Valeria, who is only a few years older than I am, has three kids now and they all look like eaglets. Tia Fermina and Tia Estela look almost exactly the same since the last time I was here. The Montenegro women don't age much, apparently. Their husbands, Tio Raul and Tio Leonel, stand next to them, both wearing cowboy hats. Tia Fermina and Tia Estela hug me for a long time and call me Mija, Niña Hermosa, Chiquita. It makes me feel like I'm two years old, but I have to admit I enjoy it. According to Mama Jacinta, Everyone is related to me somehow. I just nod, smile, and kiss everyone on the cheek like I'm supposed to.
The house is a brighter shade of pink than the last time I was there, and some of the adobe is cracked. The concrete additions look harsh against the softer colors of the original house, but that's how most homes look in Los Ojos, a clumsy mix of old and new. The cobblestone streets have been paved, which is disappointing because I always love the smell of mud when it rained, and the bakery across the street has burned down, so I won't get to wake up to the scent of baking bread in the mornings. A lot has changed in the last few years. I'm rushed to the kitchen for dinner after I greet everyone. Mexican ladies are always trying to feed you whether you like it or not. As much as I get sick of eating Mexican food every single day of my life, if heaven existed, I know it would smell like fried tortillas. Mama Jacinta gives me a giant plate of beans, rice, and shredded beef tostadas covered with sour cream, lettuce, and chopped tomatoes. You're too skinny, she tells me. By the time you leave, your mother won't even recognize you, you'll see. No one has ever called me skinny. I've lost a few pounds because the medication has made my appetite weird lately. One day I want to eat the whole world and the next day everything grosses me out. But I'm not even close to being thin. I finish the whole plate and then ask for seconds, which pleases Mama Jacinta. I also drink an entire bottle of Coca-Cola, which I normally don't even like, but it tastes so much better here. Tia Fermina and Tia Estela sit across from me and tell me how much they've missed me. And the rest of the family crowds around me and asks a million questions. How is your mother? How is your father? How cold does it get in Chicago? Why haven't you visited us in so long? When are you going to come back? What's your favorite color? Can you teach me English? I feel like a celebrity. My family back home never treats me this way because I'm the designated pariah. Here they even laugh at all my dumb jokes. Every single one. Maybe Amma was right for once. Maybe this is what I needed. Mama Jacinta teaches me how to make the menudo they sell near the town square. Unlike the porqueria of other cities and states, her version is made with meat, leg bones, and maize. That's it. No chile rojo to hide the dirty tripe. First, Mama has to track down a butcher who's just slaughtered a cow. Then she and Theo Chucho pick up the buckets of dirty cow stomach and take them to a woman they've hired to wash it. Mama Jacinta says the poor woman is even more jodida than she is, and I believe her. I don't know what I would do if my job was to literally wash shit. Mama Jacinta says that she used to clean the meat in the river, but it became so polluted that she had to start washing it in an outdoor sink. Thank God, because yesterday I saw stray dogs splashing in that filmy water, what's left of it anyway. Once the meat is thoroughly de-shitted, it's rubbed with calcium oxide and left for a while. When the calcium oxide has softened the delicate inner skin, it's peeled off slowly and carefully. Then it's washed again and again until it gleams white as fresh snow. The piece of tripe that comes from the butt has a beautiful honeycomb pattern. This is called las casitas. The thinner tripe with horizontal grooves has thick seams called callo. All the pieces are cut into slivers and the slivers are cut into squares. The nerves are tough and slippery and resist the knife. The raw meat has a strong animal smell, and as you slice and slice, the tissue inevitably gets under your nails, and the scent lingers on your hands for hours. The leg bones, the tripe, and the white maize are cooked in a giant pot all night on low heat. The texture of the meat can be shocking to the average American tongue, but I like it. The pieces are soft and chewy, and the surface of the soup glitters with yellow globs of delicious fat. It's topped with lime juice, white onion, and dry oregano. When we're finished slicing, Mama Jacinta gives me a bowl of yesterday's menudo and a cup of te de manzanilla. She says it's good for nerves. Why do you think I'm nervous? You're not? It's more complicated than that. Why don't you tell me about it? Thank you, but I don't really feel like it. I look down into an empty bowl. A fly lands on a tiny piece of meat. I wave it away. Are you afraid I'll tell your mother? Well, yeah. Whatever you say stays here with me. I know you and your mother don't get along, but you're more like her than you think, she says, stirring in the honey. I seriously doubt that. You know, she was always the rebellious one. She was the first one in the family to move to the other side. But you knew that, didn't you? I told her not to go, but she says she wanted to live in Chicago where she could work and have her own house. Rebellious, Amma? My mind can't process that. My mother is the most rigid person I know. She never listened to me, always did what she wanted. You shouldn't be so hard on her, Miha. She's been through so much. Like what? I know my sisters died. 
And that's been a living nightmare for everyone. But is there something else I don't know? Something begins howling outside. Oh my God, what is that? Oh, the cats. They're very amorous right now. Even during the day, Mama Jacinta smiles. Gross. And there are two boy cats. Can you believe that? Gay cats? I gasp and slap the table. I've never heard of such a thing. Mama Jacinta chuckles. Okay, back to the story, Mama. What else happened? Is there more? She shakes her head, her pale face suddenly pulled into a deep frown. The menudo gurgles in my stomach. The animal taste crawls up my throat. They got robbed when they crossed the border, she says, wiping her hands on her apron and looking toward the door. Yes, they lost all their money. Didn't your mother ever tell you that? Yeah, she said it was the worst days of her life, but that was before Olga died. Mama Jacinta rubs her temples as if this conversation were giving her a headache. Ay, mi pobre hija. She's had such a bad luck in this life. I hope God has mercy on her from now on. She's suffered too much. I don't know what to say, so I drink the rest of my lukewarm tea and watch one of the cats pace back and forth outside. Chapter 20 When I look in the faded mirrors in Mama Jacinta's house, sometimes I think I almost look like my sister, which means I kind of look like my mother, especially when I take off my glasses. Now that I lost a little bit of weight, I can see the faint suggestion of cheekbones. I guess our noses were similar too, rounded and slightly turned up at the tip. I used to think Olga and I didn't look like sisters, but I was wrong. There are black and white pictures of my great-grandparents in several rooms of the house. They look serious in each one, as if they're ready to stab the photographer. Maybe it wasn't customary to smile for portraits back then. I know people used to believe photographs would steal their souls, which makes sense to me. I never paid attention to Amma's old bedroom when I was a kid. She and Tia Estela used to share a cramped, dusty room all the way in the back of the house. They even had to sleep in the same lumpy bed, which has never been replaced. I can't imagine having to sleep next to my sister my whole life. We've always been poor, and I've never had much privacy, but at least I've always had my own room. When my grandfather was alive, he kept making additions whenever they had more children, but he was never able to keep up. There were eight of them. I hate when Amma goes through my things, and here I am doing it to her. I don't find much, though, just a wooden chest with faded flowered dresses and tarnished bracelets. In the corner of the room, I see a framed drawing I never noticed before. It's up high, way past eye level. I take it down and look at it closely. It's Amma wearing a long dress standing in front of the fountain in the town square. She looks exactly like Olga, or Olga looked exactly like her. I wonder who drew this. I find Mama Jacinta cleaning the kitchen table. Mama Jacinta, who drew this picture of Amma? Your father. What do you mean, my father? My father doesn't draw. Who said he doesn't? I've never heard anything about this. I don't know why, but this almost makes me angry. How didn't I know this about my own dad? You didn't know Rafael could draw? He was the town artist. He drew everyone, even the mayor. Haven't you seen that drawing of your tia Fermina hanging in her living room? Your father drew that too. Not once in my whole life have I ever seen my dad draw. When I think of Papa, I picture him soaking his feet in front of the TV. But how could he stop? I mean, if that's what he loved to do, why wouldn't he do it? He probably got too busy with all the responsibilities of being a husband and father. You know how that is. You know how hard he works. Mama Jacinta takes off her apron and hangs it on a rusty hook near the fridge. But he could have made time. If I don't write, I feel like I'm going to die. How could he just stop like that? I don't know, but it's a shame because he was famous around here. I wonder how much longer until Amma sends for me. Sometimes I lie awake thinking of what I'll do when I get home. How am I going to find Olga's boyfriend? Or should I call him her lover? That word sounds ridiculous, though. I can go to her old office, but I have no idea who he is. Two things are clear, though. He wanted to make sure no one would ever find out. And he's the kind of person who could afford an expensive hotel almost every week. He has to be a doctor. The nights are usually quiet, except for the meowing cats or the rooster next door that never knows what time it is. I like it when it rains because the soft pitter-patter on the tin roof is soothing, but it never lasts more than a few minutes. I twist under the scratchy blankets, thinking about Olga and worrying about what will happen to me if I miss too many days of school. I write notes to myself about what to do when I leave. 1. Read all of Olga's emails. 2. 
Talk to Mr. Ingvin about what to do about my absences. Three, find a summer job so I can pay for my trip to college. When I'm lucky, I fall asleep before the sun comes up. My cousin Belen, Tia Fermina's youngest daughter, is the town hot girl. She's dark, blue-eyed, and about a foot taller than I am. Her waist is impossibly small, and she loves to show it off in half shirts and skin-tight dresses. Wherever we go, every living creature eyes her up and down. I swear to God, I even saw a stray dog check her out. She gets marriage proposals when we walk down the street, and all she does is laugh and flip her hair. I feel kind of ugly next to her. Belen has decided that she's going to show me around and introduce me to anyone we see. She comes over to Mama Jacinta's house after school and drags me out, though I'd rather stay in the yard reading. My cousin doesn't understand that I can be very awkward and that I don't like talking to strangers. Today we say hello to a pair of twins nicknamed Gorduras and Mantecas, literally fats and lards, in front of the supermarket. Mexican nicknames are as cruel as they are hilarious. We usually get ice cream or aguas frescas from the town square and then take a tour of Los Ojos, even though I've been here before. When we go up and down the hills, I study all the colorful houses and try to peer inside, since everyone leaves their doors open during the day. Usually, I don't see anything interesting, but yesterday, I saw a woman in a towel dancing to Juan Gabriel in her living room. I like taking these walks during dinner time because of the dinner smells wafting from the houses. Toasted chiles, stewed meat, boiled beans. Belen gossips about everyone in town, even when I have no idea who they are. The latest dirt is that the lady who owns the most popular burger stand is having sex with her second cousin. She also tells me the story of a man named Santos who left Ojos many years ago with the dream of becoming a dancer in Los Angeles. He tried crossing the border several times before he gave up and stayed in Tijuana. The rumor was that he began dressing like a woman and became a prostitute. When he returned to Los Ojos several years later, he was practically a living skeleton. Toward the very end, the sores all over his face and mouth attracted flies. His mother would sit next to him and shoo them away with a rag. Some of the townspeople said that it was his own fault for being gay, for bending over for all of Tijuana. I keep trying to interrupt and explain to Belen that AIDS isn't a gay disease, that anyone can get it, but she doesn't listen. She never seems to listen to anything I say. I feel a longing in my chest when we pass Apa's abandoned childhood home. Mama Jacinta points it out every time I'm here. No one has lived there in a long, long time, and it's about to fall apart. All of my father's brothers and sisters are scattered across the United States, Texas, Los Angeles, North Carolina, and Chicago. His parents died right after he and Amal left Los Ojos. My grandfather got a tumor that ate away his lungs, and my grandma followed him a few months later. They say she died of sadness. Can I miss people I've never met? Because I think I do. Belen tries to get me to talk to boys from her school, but I'm never interested in any of them. Maybe it's because of the medication, but sex, anything related to it, is not really on my mind. That's where the narcos beheaded the mayor, Belen says casually, after we pass a group of her friends. She nods toward a depressing park made of metal and concrete. What? I'm not sure if I heard her correctly. You didn't know? They used to shoot each other in the streets and blow up houses. It hasn't happened in a while, though, see? She says, pointing to a charred house in the distance. A Molotov cocktail. I shudder as I think of the mayor's head rolling down the concrete and onto the street. Why would Amma send me here? Are we safe? Would they murder us too? I feel hot and cold at the same time. I jump when I hear a bird squawk. Belen laughs. No, tonta. Why would they care about you? Unless you're trafficking drugs and didn't tell me about it. I shrug, feeling stupid. Oh, but never, ever stay out late, especially alone. No one does anymore. Chapter 21 My cousin Paulina is turning three, so I can't imagine that slaughtering and frying an animal would be very exciting for her, but that's how parties always are. Every milestone or accomplishment leads to alcohol and obscene amounts of fried meat. That afternoon, Belen... Mama Jacinta and I walk over to the venue where the rest of the family has been preparing all morning. When we cross the town square, the Indian ladies with long black braids that look like rope try to sell us mopales. Their thick hair reminds me of Apa. Strangers on the streets have offered her money in exchange for her shiny braids. 
The women sit on the ground with a large wicker basket full of peeled and spiced cactus in little plastic bags. How poor do you have to be to sell something that's free? I can literally walk up to any nopal in town and cut off a pal. I see Mama Jacinta do it all the time. The worst part is not even peeling them. It's getting rid of all the slime. I've always wondered why the bottoms of tree trunks here were painted white, but I've never asked about it. I stare at the sad, rusted fountain and wonder if they'll ever turn the water back on. A girl with the baby strapped to her back with an embroidered orange cloth stands up and puts her hand in front of me. Por favor, señorita, she pleads. Una limosna. She looks about 13, so small and bony. I can't imagine that baby coming out of her. I pray it's not hers. Don't listen to them, Belen says. They're here begging every day. She should work like everyone else. Typical Indias. Belen practically spits out the words. I don't understand why she thinks she's so much better than they are. She's just as dark and wears the same frayed red dress every other day. Have you looked at yourself? I mumble. What? Nothing. I turn back to the baby who is crying now, his face covered with dirt and snot. I give the girl all the change in my pocket. Belen crosses her arms over her chest and shakes her head. The party venue is owned by Los Garzas, the richest family in Los Ojos. According to Belen, they got rich by selling drugs. When I ask her what kind of drugs, all she says is the worst kind. I hear a violent squealing when we approach and look at Mama Jacinta, my stomach sinking. They're killing it right now. I thought it would be dead already. Sorry, mija. We can take a walk and come back if you want. Don't be a baby, Belen says. You eat me, don't you? Yeah, but I've never seen my tacos killed before my eyes. Ay, Dios mío, you Americans are so delicate, Belen says. Come on, let's go for a walk. Mama Jacinta says, placing her warm hand on my arm. No, it's okay. Let's go. Dio Chucho and my cousin Andres drag the writhing pig with a long red rope. Its desperate and brutal cries give me goosebumps. Once they get the poor thing onto a slab of concrete, Andres stabs it in the heart. Good job, mijo, Dio says. The pig squirms all over the ground and its squeals become deeper and more anguishing. The blood gushes from its chest. I feel lightheaded. Are you excited for the chicharrones, prima? Andres shouts to me. Oh yeah, delicious. Can't wait, I yell back. When the pig finally dies, Andres and Tio Chucho hang it by its hind leg and bleed it out into a bucket. Once it's drained, they begin to cut it into pieces. I try not to look, but I can't help it. My eyes are drawn to the blood. After a while, I can hear the pop and crackle of the frying flesh. I'm sick to my stomach, but my mouth still waters. The human body is so weird sometimes. Once all the meat is cooked, Tia Estela brings me a plate of rice, beans, and chicharrones. Andale, mija. She says and squeezes my shoulder. You need to put some weight back on. It's funny how in the United States I'm too fat and in Mexico I'm too skinny. I know Tia is worried about me. The Montenegro women are all excellent warriors. I smile and say thank you because the rudest thing you can do to a Mexican lady is refuse her food. Might as well spit on a picture of La Virgen de Guadalupe or turn the TV off during Sábado Gigante. I take a few chicharrones, put them in a soft tortilla, and drown them in dark red salsa. I eat them without much difficulty, but when I make my next taco, I see a few thick hairs jutting from the skin. I don't want everyone to think I'm a spoiled American princess, so I close my eyes and inhale the taco as quickly as possible. I imagine my face a beautiful shade of putrid green when I'm finished, but I'm proud of my triumph. The dance floor begins to get crowded once everyone is full of pig meat. The music is tinny and crackly, partly because of the cheap sound system, but I still like it. The accordions sound ridiculously joyful, even when the songs are about death. Tia Fermina and Tio Raul dance cheek to cheek. Belen dances with Mama Jacinta's lanky next door neighbor. I watch everyone's jumpy little dances as the sun bakes me into a cocoon of laziness. I start to nod off in my chair when Andres pokes me in the shoulder and tells me we're going to ride horses. Come on, prima, he says, pulling me up. I'm tired. I don't feel like it. I try to slump back down. It'll be good for you. How? Trust me. Defeated, I follow Andres to the field next to the venue where two black horses are tied to a fence. This one is Isabella, he says, pointing to the smaller one. And this is Sebastian. Andres rubs the horse's side and smiles. Nice to meet you. 
I pretend to shake their hooves. They're married, you know? Married? What are you talking about? Imagining Isabella in a wedding gown makes me laugh so hard I snort. Did they have a wedding? Did they waltz? Did she throw a bouquet? Obviously, they didn't have a wedding, Tonta, but they're a real couple. Andres seems annoyed that I find it so funny that I'm having a hard time believing in romantic love between two animals. Really? When they're separated, Sebastian cries, I swear to God, big fat tears. Andres looks serious, so I stop laughing. He even crosses himself to make a point. As Andres gets the saddles from the shed, I pet Isabella's back and run my fingers through her coarse black mane. Her coat is so dark it's almost blue. Her muscles are tight and shimmer in the sunlight. I don't think I've ever seen something so beautiful in my whole entire life. It's almost bewildering. I'm surprised by how much I love being on a horse again. To feel its tremendous strength under me. Andres and I ride toward the river. It's quiet except for the clackling hooves and buzzing insects in the yellowed grass. A flock of gray birds passes over us and settles in a giant tree. Doves, Andres says. The river is nearly gone now because of the drought. The only water that remains is brownish green and full of garbage, plastic bags, bottles, wrappers, and even a solitary shoe. I shiver when I remember my dream about Olga as a mermaid. I can still see her glowing face so clearly. The abandoned train station next to the river is boarded up now, the red paint peeling off in giant strips. The tracks are rusted and the wood is worn. Andres says the train has been gone for years now. It used to be bustling with people, but the company was crooked and couldn't sustain itself. I remember Mama Jacinta bringing me and Olga here when I was little. She bought us tiny wooden boxes of fajeta that was so sweet and sticky it hurt my teeth for hours. I also know that Papa Feliciano used to take this train to sell pots and pans in other towns. He died before they closed the line. I guess in a way it's good that he never saw it shut down. He loved that train. Big fat flies begin biting Isabella's face and neck when we approach a clearing. She shakes her head to get them off, but it's no use. Even if I swat them away, they come right back. My hand is smeared with blood when I rub her where the flies have landed. I kiss the back of her head when Andres isn't looking. We ride along the river until the sun dips behind the trees and the crickets begin to sing. A field of corn in the distance looks dry and shriveled, and I wonder what would happen if someone flicked a match at it. I could ride Isabella forever, but Andres says we should get back to the party so Mama Jacinta doesn't worry. When I say goodbye to Isabella, I press my face against her side and run my hand over her back. I think I can hear her heartbeat. Suddenly, I remember the time Olga and I rode our great uncle's horses, the second time we came to Los Ojos. At first, I was too scared, but Olga told me that the horses wouldn't hurt me because they were magical creatures, and I believed her. Andres laughs. What are you doing? I smile. Nothing. Just giving her a hug. Tio Chucho walks toward me, holding a beer. Andale, mija, let's dance. He looks a little wobbly. No, thanks, Tio. I'm not much of a dancer. Nonsense, he says, and leads me to the dance floor. The Montenegros are the best dancers in Los Ojos. The song is about three girls who drive to a carnival and plummet to their deaths when the truck flips over the side of a cliff. I'm not sure why anyone would want to dance to that. The old chucho smells like he's sweating beer. His shirt is damp and his skin is sticky, but I keep dancing because I don't want to hurt his feelings. He's having a great time, spinning me around and singing along at the top of his lungs. After the third song, a group of men wearing black masks and holding rifles walks toward the entrance of the venue. Theo lets go of my hand. His face slackens. Chinga su madre, he mutters. Get Theo, what's happening? Nothing, mija. I'll take care of it, Theo says and walks toward them. Everyone looks stiff and worried, but no one says a word. It's suddenly a party full of statues. Andres just keeps blinking. He looks like he might pass out. Are they soldiers? Are they narcos? I have no idea. One of the masked men stares at me the entire time as if he's drilling holes into my body with his eyes. Theo Chucho pulls an envelope from his pocket and hands it to one of the men who nods toward Andres. Theo returns to the party looking pale and terrified. When the man finally turns away from me, I notice a faded Santa Muerte tattoo on his forearm. What the hell was that? I whisper to Belen. You need to stop asking so many questions, she says, and turns away from me.